This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast, a podcast with a worldwide listenership that explores the broad world of preservation from every angle, from drones to mudlarking and everything in between. Now, let's get preserving. PreserveCast is a nationwide podcast exploring topics in history, preservation, and place from all around the country and the world. But our heart will always be in Maryland, where we're based and produced. So this week, we're talking with Laura Rennie, the editorial manager of Maryland Road Trips, to see how one new site is working to connect people to place with lessons learned along the way for anyone listening who cares to do the same. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to Preserve Cast, And today, we're excited to be joined by Laura Rennie, who is the editorial manager of Maryland Road Trips. Uh, and we're going to be talking all about how you sort of sell the idea of visiting places and create uh, enthusiasm and chronicle these places and um, what lessons learned there are for people not only here in Maryland, but all across the country who are interested in doing this sort of thing. So um, Laura, it's it's fun to have you here and to be able to get talking with you about this before we get started and kind of dive into the work that you guys do and what you do as an editorial manager. Um, I'd love to learn more about like where you grew up and what got you interested in writing and, and telling stories. A lot of times we talk to historians and preservationists, um, and you're doing the work of preserving and telling history, but you're kind of coming at it from a different angle. So what, where did you get your start? What was your first job? All that good stuff. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. I grew up in Northern Virginia, specifically in Alexandria and Springfield, And, uh, you know, reading was just always one of my hobbies as a kid. I always had a book in hand and I was teased at an early age for being like a reporter all the time because I was always asking questions. I always had a notebook in my hand. I just love hearing about people's backgrounds and what makes them tick and what places and experiences shape who they are as a person. And because writing and reading were such an integral part of who I am, um, you can imagine that I I was that uh, newspaper nerd in high school, and that followed me into college writing for the school paper, and from there working for small town newspaper, women's magazines. Um, I used to have my own blog. It's just a big part of who I am as a person. And so your first job out was with a small newspaper? Is that yes. sort of where you where you went? And where was that? Was that in this area? It was in Harrisonburg, Virginia. So I went to James Madison University and studied print journalism. And while I was a student, I interned at their local newspaper and then worked there after college and before moving up to Frederick. So now you're in Frederick, Maryland, which for people who aren't familiar or they live outside of the country or something like that, it's in the middle part of the state of Maryland, almost smack dab in the middle, really. Um, And you're working for um, a production called Maryland Road Trips. So it's new, but let's talk a little bit about the creation of the site and what you're hoping to accomplish and I guess sort of the background behind it, too. Absolutely. Well, there's a lot to cover there. Um, The site was a byproduct of the pandemic, actually. Um, Postern, the marketing agency behind Postern Publishing and Maryland Road Trips, saw a lot of their clients in the tourism and hospitality industry struggling as a result of travel restrictions. So Postern um, considered what we could do to grow the business in a way that not only supported our clients, but also small businesses and unique destinations throughout the state. And given our existing portfolio and tourism publications, the, the founding of Postern Publishing and therefore Maryland Road Trips was just a natural next step. And so the whole idea behind it is that well, what? I mean, maybe I don't want to phrase it. How how would you describe what it is you do? Oh, thank you. So what it is we do is, well, we aim to do is provide high quality content for people who are interested in exploring Maryland, whether they live here already or are out of state. We want to show people that there's so much to be discovered in Maryland and domestic car travel, you know, it was already kind of trending for a while, but then COVID really accelerated that trend. So we want to put people in their cars, 
have them drive around Maryland. There's so much to be discovered in Maryland. And with more people taken to their cars, we wanted to create a platform where the small businesses and obscure attractions and everything else that you can find here would be placed front and center. And does it follow a pattern that you've seen? I mean, you're talking about sort of like car travel around the country. I think this is interesting for people who run historic sites or who work in the preservation field, um, sort of understanding this trend. It's You sort of said it's trending up, and obviously there's data that that's behind this. Is this – are there other sites like this around the country? Is there sort of a trend to kind of try and be hyper-local in – your focus. I mean, it sort of seems like with where journalism now is now, it's so valuable to have sort of like hyper local stuff. You're not just reading retrod AP articles over and over and, and, you know, kind of getting that really hyper local content is important. Does that work and jive well with sort of this, this data that you're talking about and sort of the expansion of car travel and um, people oh, visiting, absolutely. visiting nearby? Yes, we, well, we really love, finding those people in Maryland and working with them Um, as the editorial manager. Part of my job is to find collaborators and writers. And just on Instagram alone, I'm finding so many people who make it their mission to show people that there's things to do where they live, whether that's Baltimore or Western Maryland or the Eastern shore. And they're just so hyper-focused on that one area And it's really neat to be able to say, hey, I'm coming, you know, from Maryland road trips. We want to bring people to Maryland. Tell me about the part of the state that you're coming from and what do you love about it and go from there. And I'm curious, what does the data show? Is it mostly a Maryland audience that's reading it? Is it a balance? Is it? And the reason I ask that is I think for people here in Maryland and even across the country, somebody in Utah thinking you're doing something similar, um, and I guess we're different. Maybe Utah is not a perfect example because that's a pretty pretty big state. Uh, yeah. and we have we have a lot of neighbors. But okay, somebody in Rhode Island thinking about doing something like this, is it a lot of spillover from nearby states? Do you know data wise what that looks like? What what's your what's your audience? Well, I like to say our audience is anyone with a driver's license. <laughs> so you know, a reader in California, hey, come out our way. But the data does show that we have readership here in Maryland and in the surrounding states. Now, I'm sure we do have readership outside of the East Coast. I know specifically of readers out West who have lived in Maryland and it holds a special place in their heart now that they've moved away. They like to keep tabs on what's going on by checking out our website and our social media. And it gives them ideas of what to do the next time you know, they're back in, in Maryland. So it's a little bit of, of all of it. And I guess you're, as as it sort of evolves, you want to track that you're, you imagine you're hyper-focused on the analytics and who's reading what, and what kind of articles they like to read. And we'll talk a little bit about the articles and stuff. So this is, again, you know, we're profiling and chronicling you guys, but it's interesting kind of just as this sort of, as you say, this sort of this trend where we're headed when you're looking for stories to tell and places to profile, what are you as a, um, uh, you know, an editorial manager looking for? Well, we're looking for, is this something that people can actually do? Do they want to do it? And what else is nearby that we can spotlight? So how can we get people into shops, restaurants, different sites that maybe wouldn't be advertised on a highway billboard sign or isn't right off of the interstate? So encouraging people to get off the beaten path, you know, and we want them to be able to navigate various regions of the state, not just to arrive at a destination, but then also to take in the many spots along the way that are part of the journey. Yeah. And it's interesting, like along those lines, there's, you know, there's lots of travel information out there. Certainly a lot of stuff about the the big high profile sites. Yes. Not all of it is great or high quality. I mean, like just because you're on Yelp doesn't mean that you've got good information to go along with it. Um, And there's, you know, there's some lousy sort of amalgamated travel sites where it's just a bunch of returned content, you know, almost like Wikipedia articles that have been kind of like repopulated. How do you try and stand out and, and what 
what does that, what do you feel like that gets you um, in terms of the audience? Yeah. Well, we definitely want to stand out from that lower quality content. We really strive to produce strong articles. And I think that we achieve that. I, I got to meet one of our writers in person recently. We've been working together for almost a year and we were finally able to meet up. And as we were talking, she said that she really appreciated that at Maryland Road Trips, we always encourage, if not require, our writers to actually go out and experience the places that they're writing about. She said, you wouldn't believe how many well-known publications I write for that just want quick content. They don't care if you've actually tried the thing that you're writing about, or if you've actually gone and visited, visited that historic site, they just want quick content. And that's not how we handle our work at Maryland Road Trips. We want people to read the article and see this person actually went out and took this trip. You know, this is their favorite shop that they went to. This is the burger that they're dreaming of now that they've had it. Um, this is that really cool hiking trail that they highly recommend that sort of thing. Yeah. And I think that that conveys in content. I think people, it's an important sort of lesson writ large, um, even for groups or, you know, an individual listening outside of this area who works in historic preservation or heritage tourism, um, that cheaply done quickly, sloppy content comes across as such. I think the, yes. the I think that like we we think too little sometimes as content creators of our audience. And I think it it comes across like they, they know when they're reading something that's good and somebody who's actually been there versus like, oh, this is just sort of like copy and pasted stuff of what they, you know, were able to find online. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I think that, you know, in some ways that's also even like the rise of podcasts, right? Which comes out of you know, this is getting really big and kind of off track, but, but, you know, radio companies that didn't really care what their listeners were listening to and they were creating stuff that was just really kind of terrible. And people were like, yeah, I don't, I don't actually have to listen to that. I kind of, you know, I want to listen to something that like is, you know, there's purpose behind it. Um, yeah. and I think that that's, you know, sometimes you miss the boat on that. So I think it's interesting. I think it's a component that people should take a look at, um, you know, and, and, um, we don't we don't have just for the interest of full disclosure we have no uh, commercial partnership between us this is not a, an extended ad or anything like that we just think that the the concept is really cool and we're going to try and do some content sharing between our organizations um but the the idea uh, in general is i think something that um would benefit a lot of different states to take a look at. So um, why don't we take a break here and then let's come back and talk about what you've published and some stories and things like that and maybe some lessons learned for, for those listeners like we've been talking about from here in Maryland and all beyond. And we'll do that right here on PreserveCast. Hey, it's Nick here. And I want to remind you briefly that your support is what makes this podcast possible. To keep hearing important stories like this one, be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and follow along on social media at PreserveCast. You can also continue supporting the podcast with a donation at PreserveCast.org. PreserveCast is sponsored by the 1772 Foundation and powered by Preservation Maryland, a nonprofit organization that believes we all succeed when we all know more about our past. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast. Uh, today, we're joined by Laura Rennie, who is the editorial manager of Maryland Road Trips. And we've been talking about how to create high content or high quality, I should say, content for, um, you know, heritage tourism and place based uh, visitation um, and the work that they've been doing and how it kind of arose out of the pandemic. Um, and so... How much have you published so far? What's the, you know, what's the editorial calendar look like for a site like this in order to get like eyeballs and clicks? What kind of, what, what amount of content are you having to publish to feel like you're, you're staying, you know, above water and getting people visiting your site? Right. Well, as of today, we have 160 articles on the site. So I'm really proud of that. We started last fall. And for about two months, we were sharing two articles a week and then quickly turned over to three articles a week. And we've kept that up. 
since I would say last November. And how does, I mean, I think some people listening are probably curious, how does it stay in business and actually have like paid staff? And how does, how does that all work? Is it all advertising based? Yes, it is advertising based. We work with really wonderful, supportive advertisers, and we're always looking for ways to support our advertisers in return, you know, just have really wonderful working relationships with them. One of our newest offerings for advertisers that I'm really excited about is where we have writers go and enjoy an experience that the advertiser, you know, wants people to know about. And then they write an article just like they would if they were taking the trip on their own. So we don't want it to read like an advertorial. We want it to read just like any other piece on our site. And I'm really proud of the content that's coming out of this new offering. We have one coming up in October that shows a road trip from Baltimore to Gettysburg. It will be our first time featuring an out-of-state location, but Gettysburg is just right over the border and it's obviously a huge draw for tourists. But this road trip shows different Civil War spots in Maryland and then ends at Gettysburg and, and highlights some really unique exhibits at Gettysburg. And that's through our partnership with the Gettysburg Foundation. So it kind of gives you an idea of how, how, to, how to cross-pollinate. And, and obviously there's you know, there's a business associated with this. And I think it's, you know, it's an important component for people to understand how this kind of all comes together and how it works. Um, So you've published a lot. I mean, you know, 160 articles, two articles a week, three articles a week. Um, That's a lot of content to, to write. And obviously you're not writing all of it. You've got people out there in the field doing this and visiting these places. Do you have any, now I know this is probably difficult for somebody who has to, you know, manage the site, um, but do you have any favorite stories or places so far? And then we'll move to like quirkiest and then maybe some good autumn um, recommendations for people here in Maryland and and throughout the mid-Atlantic who might want to drop in on us um, during the, during the fall. Yeah. We'll we'll start with favorite places. Well, like you said, that's really hard for me to choose. I, I just can't tell you how proud I am of the website. Every time I go on, which is frequent, I'm just like, wow, I'm so proud of the work that we're doing. Maryland is a really cool state and I've only lived here nine years, so not a super long time. And I'm constantly discovering new things to do because of the work that I'm doing here at Maryland Road Trips. Um, and a lot of my travel inspiration comes from the content that we produce. So for example, one of our writers did a piece on Glenstone Museum in Potomac, Maryland. And every time I mention this museum to people, they look at me like, what? They've never heard of this museum, but it's so close to Washington, D.C., And it's this beautiful property. And I actually haven't been myself. It's been on my list of places to go ever since I edited the article. And I'm actually going this Friday. So I'm really excited about that. That's pretty cool. That's a good one. It's an interesting one. It's an art museum sort of off the beaten path. Right. But yeah, Yeah. that's a cool one. We also have a piece on our site about um, going sailing on the Chesapeake Bay. Our editor, Chris Vandergrift, wrote that piece, and he just did a really nice job of weaving in his background as being married to a woman who grew up sailing and the high expectations that his in-laws had on him as he was learning how to (laughs) sail and then going out and getting to sail on the Chesapeake Bay um, with his wife and friends. And it was a really nice piece. We also have an article called Love That, Do This, which um, suggests historic Maryland locations for people who love super well-known spots like Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, Williamsburg, Virginia, et cetera. Wow. That's a cool cool concept um, just in general. I I like that. It's almost like the uh, sort of like the... uh, road trip version of um other customers have looked at on amazon right like yes. uh, well wow yes, i guess exactly i guess i'm like them i should buy that thing too um so I, that that's really cool so okay quirkiest what do you what do you would say is the quirkiest so far or quirk 
several quirky if you yes. can if you can't change your sh- choose your favorite quirk well i'm all for quirk um we ha- actually have a category on our site labeled oddities so if you're <laughs> listening to this and you're like i want more quirk go to our oddities category you'll find lots of great content but i would say one of the quirkiest places that we've profiled is dinosaur park in laurel maryland I don't know if you're familiar with this, but I actually think I'm familiar because of Maryland road trips. Oh, I'm not, okay. That's not even, that's not even a plug. Uh, that oh was, that's just, that's just the reality of it. Yeah. I want to take my daughter to this place. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, I was driving in Laurel um, last year, I believe it was right after I took the job for Maryland road trips. And I'm not often in that part of the state. And as I'm driving, I see this sign for dinosaur park and I was like, oh, I need a red light. I need to write this down before I forget it. We need to write about Dinosaur Park. What is Dinosaur Park? And it turns out it's an active dig site in the middle of a business park in Laurel. And people can actually go during their monthly open houses and search for fossils. It is super cool. Yeah. And there's a dinosaur themed uh, playground there as well. That's right. Yeah. You guys have some good pics of it. If you go online, the reviews for the park are actually really mixed and some of them are pretty, pretty negative. And our writer set out to see like, how can people get the best experience out of Dinosaur Park? Because it's a really incredible place. You just have to know when to go and what to expect. And so I'm really pleased with how how that piece went out. And like you, I can't wait to go and take my daughter. Yeah. Yeah, negative reviews for stunning and interesting places always fascinate me. There's a whole that that would be a good future preserve cast. And if you've seen the negative reviews of national parks and things like that, um, right? Oh the, my ne- the negative reviews of Old Faithful, um, those are those are funny. You should look those up. All right, so um, best autumn spots that you'd recommend in Maryland? Do you have any? You must have some good autumn stuff on the site. We do. We have great fall content. So. Today, this morning at nine o'clock, well, it won't be this morning by the time this podcast airs, but (laughs) um, we just posted a piece on where to enjoy fall views in Maryland, whether you're in your car, on your bike. Super timely. I didn't even know that when I asked this question. (laughs) Yes, I know. It's very timely. So if you don't want to get out of your car, we have a long list of places where you can just drive through and enjoy the fall views. Or if you want, you know, to get the family on a bicycle or out on a hike, it's a really great extensive list of spots all across the state to enjoy fall foliage. And then we also have an upcoming piece on where to enjoy fall colors by boat. Yeah, that's a yeah. cool idea. Yeah. And then um, I personally would Yeah, say, I was going to ask you, do you have a personal one? Yeah, good. Well, there are so many. And as someone who lives in Frederick, we were very close to a lot of great spots. Um, but I hiked Annapolis Rocks for the first time last October. And the views from Annapolis Rock were really stunning. So I highly recommend that hike for people who haven't done it before. Perfect. So... For someone listening in the country, we've talked, there's some really good examples in here, but that they were thinking about doing something like this for their state and their community. They're in Alaska or, or they're overseas for that matter. Um, recommendations, like what have been some lessons learned? And I mean, maybe it's not even just doing a site like this, but maybe it's just thinking about production of content and, and how, how it's worked. Um any any big lessons that you've learned or, or, or things that you thought were going to be the case that ended up not being that that way when, once you really started kind of getting into the nitty gritty of this? Yeah. Well, there have been so many lessons I've learned in the last year. It's been a really fun year and just a fun ride for somebody who loves travel and travel inspiration. One thing is that just because something might not be up my alley doesn't mean somebody else might not love it. An example of that is last year, someone pitched us the idea of a barn quilt tour. Uh, I had never heard of barn quilts before. Mm -hmm. And when I looked it up, I was like, I don't know 
is this something people are really going to want to do, like drive around and look at artwork on the side of barns? I, w- I just wasn't sure. And again, this is at the beginning of our website's creation. And I, I couldn't decide, but we really trusted the writer. She's a great writer. And we said, let's go for it because this is something people can do from the safety of their car. And that's important, you know, during COVID. Well, it's one of the top performing articles on our website. Really? Yes. And after reading it, I kid you not, I, I read it and I thought, I have to do this. I, I'm interested. Like, and that's such a cool aspect of our website is you might not think something interests you, but then you read about someone's experience and you catch that bug, you know, you catch their passion for it. So I would say kind of get outside of your own head and think about what, what other people might be wanting. Um, and then also look for people that you can collaborate with. Don't try to do it all on your own. We've made so many great connections with other content, you know, producers in Maryland and and in DC and Virginia who love coming to Maryland and writing about their experiences here. So reaching out to them and saying, how can we work together? That's been a really rewarding part of my job. And what about specifically with content itself? Is there like a sweet spot in terms of length? I think a lot of people are really gun shy when it comes to like creating blogs and content about place. Um, You know, maybe they're in the heritage tourism world or maybe they run a preservation group or whatever it might be. What's What's the sweet spot? I mean, I think a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, I couldn't write a whole article and they think article is like a feature in the, you know, the Washington Post or the Washingtonian and, or the New Yorker for that matter. And that's not really what, what you need, but like, what is the sweet spot for that? What do you know from the data? I wish I had an easy answer for that. It seems to fluctuate. It, it can depend on the topic. Um, I would say, you know, the majority of our content is either in the like 600 to 800 word range, which might be more like a listicle format. Mm-hmm. or a spotlight on one specific destination, like a specific brewery or a specific store. Um, and then our longer form content might be anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500 words. And both perform really well. And we try to just do a mix of both. I personally love long form content and we have always strived to have our website read like an actual travel magazine versus like Buzzfeed. You know, we don't want to be travel Buzzfeed. Um, And so while we do have content that you can pull up quickly on your phone and get ideas for, you know, a swimming spot near a swimming hole nearby, we also want to be a website where you can go and really get lost in a story and be inspired. And obviously that works well just in terms of people look, I mean, people like that kind of stuff. And you're right. I guess there's a balance of people looking for shorter things, people looking for longer things and meeting meeting the audience and paying attention to your analytics. So what's next for the site? And, and also, you know, we'll have the link in the show notes, but where can people find everything? But, but where are you headed and where do they find you? Great. Well, where we're headed is we have a really great lineup of holiday and cold weather content coming up. You know, I think that people feel a little bit discouraged when the temperatures drop, like, oh, I'm going to be stuck at home. But there are still so many ways to explore, um, even in the cold weather months. So we, we've been working on filling out our editorial calendar, um, coming up with unique ways to collaborate with our advertisers and then long-term projects. You know, we'd love to see Maryland road trips in printed form one day. We've talked about doing a podcast. Um, We have a lot of great giveaways coming up on Instagram. So there's always different ideas in the works. Very cool. And people can sign up. Is there a, a way to kind of get a newsletter and stuff like that as well on your site? Oh, absolutely. Yes, we do have a monthly newsletter that people can get to from our website, MarylandRoadTrips.com. And if you 
want to follow what we're doing on Facebook and Instagram, we're at Maryland Road Trips. And then on Twitter at Road Trips MD. Perfect. Um, and before we go, what's your favorite historic place or site? It need not be Maryland. Um, you know, so don't feel like you're betraying Maryland Road Trips if you pick somewhere else. But what would be your favorite historic place or site? This is hard for me. I really love history. I would say that Mount Vernon in Virginia holds a, an extra special place in my heart. I grew up going there frequently as a kid. Both of my parents grew up in neighborhoods around Mount Vernon. And then my husband and I had our wedding reception there. So it's just near and dear to my heart. Um, but that's what a, I love... That's a good one. I like yeah. that. We've also, I think we've had... I think we've had four guests uh, on from Mount Vernon, from the head of carpentry to the the vice presidents um, to preservationists. We've we've had quite a few Mount Vernon folks on over the years here. So that's really cool. Good answer. Yeah, and my dad's electric company did all the has done all the electrical work there too. So he's always pointing out different lighting to me while we're there. Like, okay, dad, I'm not really that interested, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a perfect way to end this and, and a, and a, and a great connection to place and story. It's been fun having you on. Um, we'll definitely keep our listeners updated, uh, with cool things to do. I mean, we're a, a podcast that looks at preservation across the across the country and across the globe for that matter. But we're obviously our, our heart is here in Maryland and we're, we're based and produced here in Maryland. And so the more Maryland stories that we can share, the, the always the better, uh, particularly ones that resonate um, and have stories um, for listeners all across the country to think about. So thanks so much for joining us today, Laura. Thank you for having me. And Nick, I would love to ask you, what is your favorite place to travel to in Maryland or what's one of your favorite historic sites here? Wow. You've turned the tables. I've never, no one's been gutsy enough to ask me a question on preserve. <laughs> I told I love, you I have a reporter side. <laughs> I love this. So everyone, we're going to cut this. No, I'm kidding. Um, let's think here. My fa Well, I can't, I think it, it might be dangerous for me to see my favorite place to go to in Maryland. I will say this time of year, specifically right now, um, one of my favorite places to go is down along Antietam Creek um, mm -hmm. and to do the Antietam Creek Trail um, at Antietam National Battlefield, um, which is sort of a trail that you won't find a lot of tourists on. You find a lot of locals on it. Um, and it takes you down the alluvial plain of the Antietam and you get to kind of like meander along down there and see the Antietam Creek which was this formidable obstacle during the battle um, from a different perspective. Um, and this time of year, there's normally a ton of pawpaws as well. So it is a, uh, it's a beautiful place and a good place to go in early autumn. So yeah. good question. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk to you again soon. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to PreserveCast. To dig deeper into this episode's story, head over to preservecast.org for show notes and our collection of previous episodes. Don't forget to engage with this podcast by subscribing, commenting, and leaving a review. Follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at PreserveCast for even more. PreserveCast is currently recorded in Walkersville, Maryland, and sponsored by the 1772 Foundation, and powered by Preservation Maryland. Thanks for listening, and keep on preserving.